Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Williams. I am the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Most of you probably already knew that. So welcome into our session today. This is a listening session that we're doing with some of the candidates in the Saanich Gulf Islands riding um, who are all aspiring to have an office very near or inside that building that you're seeing on screen right now. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work in the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen speaking Coast Salish nations, the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations. This writing encompasses another larger segment of Lekwungen territory and Coast Salish territory, which will be recognized, I'm sure, by some of our participants who are in other jurisdictions, along with the one which I'm in right now. I would also like to acknowledge those who are marking the High Holy Days of Rosh Hashanah right now and are marking their beginning of Yom Kippur tomorrow to celebrate that. So our greetings to all of you. The session we're doing today is more of a listening session. This is not a debate. It also involves the four parties who are currently represented in the House of Commons. We do it in this format to uh, purposefully enable all of these candidates to get in as much information as is possible about the issues that we're going to be covering and talking about today. We are live streaming this over Facebook. This is also being recorded and will be available for others to listen to as many times as you like over and over again on repeat. We encourage that sort of thing to find out where everybody stands on the issues. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And uh, we're going to introduce the panel to you right now, and then we'll get underway with our conversations. With us today, Sabina Singh is the candidate for the Federal New, Democ Federal New Democratic Party. Elizabeth May is the candidate for the Green Party of Canada. David Bush is the candidate for the Conservative Party in Canada. And Sherry Moore Arbour joins us as the candidate for the Liberal Party of Canada. The format today will be uh, all four of our candidates doing about a two minute opening session remark. Uh, and then we will get into some questions where we're going to get answers of about a minute and a half or so with, with everyone. So let's get underway with the order in which people were introduced. Two minute opening remark right now from Sabina Singh. Sabina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you for having us. Um, thank you for allowing us to speak on the territory of the Lekongan, Saanich, Wasanic people, uh, Coast Salish people. For me, it's very important and meaningful. So my name is Sabina Singh. I am Dr. Sabina Singh. I have a PhD in global politics and international relations. Um, for the, I am a mother, an artist, a dancer, um, an academic. And for the last couple of years, I have been working with the Center for World Indigenous Studies and developing my workshop, Exploring Diversity and Power Through Movement with high schools throughout the community, which I would like to expand uh, beyond just high schools. Um, I'm here today because I think it's very important that we send a strong island team to Ottawa. And for me, that means joining my amazing NDP colleagues and getting sent to Ottawa to fight for you and to fight for everything that Saanich Gulf Islands needs together. So we have amazing NDP MPs up and down the island. I think I could be a good, I could be a strong uh, addition to my team. I think our leader Jagmeet Singh has been very clear and very forthright about what he wants to accomplish in this country and how we can move it forward together. So for us, the most important thing is that affordability and climate change are interrelated and that we need to move together on both issues at the same time so that we can leave no one behind, we can fight together, and we can bring Canada into the direction it needs to be, and as an example in the world of what can be done. So uh, please vote NDP, and my name is Sabina Singh. Thank you, Sabina, very much. Uh, up next, the candidate for the Green Party, Elizabeth May. The floor is yours. Oh, uh, still on mute. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, we do a lot of that in par in Parliament. The last little pandemic Parliament, we've there have been far more moments than one would imagine. Of um, Madam Minister, you are on mute. So <laughs> I'm just uh, very grateful for the opportunity, and I want to thank again uh, the Victoria Chamber of Commerce and to you, Bruce. Thank you for hosting this event. Uh, I think a lot of the viewers and certainly the business community 
knows uh, knows me already. I, uh, by way of background, I did study law at, the, at Dalhousie Law School in Nova Scotia. I practiced law in Ontario and in Nova Scotia. And over the years, kept moving further west. And I'm enormously grateful and I say again, so deeply honored for having been elected uh, as the member of parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands. Uh, my approach and the approach of the Green Party is that we are here to work for our constituents. That's what the constitution says. The constitution doesn't mention political parties, by the way. It says that uh, members of parliament represent their constituencies and that's the end of our job description. So we're very committed as Green MPs to work with and listen to uh, the public, our cit the citizens of the area, businesses, whether they voted for us or not is irrelevant. It's non-partisan service. And in that service ethic over the last 10 years, uh, and particularly in this pandemic parliament, we've worked so hard for small business. We've worked, and I'm deeply grateful to the chambers, the Sandwich Peninsula Chamber, the Salt Spring Island Chamber, and the Victoria Chamber for being eyes and ears on the ground to tell us as MPs what we need to do so that businesses can be kept whole, get through this pandemic and come out the other side of it. I'm deeply committed to that service ethic, and I hope that you'll do me the honor of returning me to Ottawa to continue that work. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, very much. Uh, up next is the candidate for the Conservative Party of Canada, David Bush. David, the floor is yours for two minutes. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you to the Chamber for hosting us today and for the territorial acknowledgement. My name is David Bush, and I'm here asking you again, after two years, for your vote. For those of you who don't recall, I hold a degree in biochemistry, and my thesis formed part of cancer, a cancer research publication. But I realized that people were more interesting and I preferred working directly with people. I went back, got a second degree in nursing, worked as a critical care nurse for a number of years and taught nursing for two different universities before the call to solve problems increased again and I went back and obtained my Juris Doctorate of Law. I've been working as a lawyer ever since. Now, my love of helping people and solving problems is part of the reason why I'm here before you today. The second half and the bigger half are my two young boys. They're four and five years old. Two years ago, I was deeply concerned about the path that Justin Trudeau was leading Canada down. Now, as our record deficits grow, the increase in gun crime, expanding wait lists for healthcare, climbing inflation and empty promises, I am deeply, deeply troubled and terrified of what this path is going to lead if we don't change course. Now, for those of you who are happy with the direction Canada is going down, you have a several choices to make. Thank you for attending today. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to your questions. And hopefully at the end of this debate or information session, you'll be in a better position to make an informed voice and an informed choice on who is the best candidate to lead Canada through to the, what you believe is important. Great, thank you, David, very much. And our fourth candidate uh, is Sherry Moore Arbour, and she is the candidate for the Liberal Party of Canada. Sherry, the floor is yours for two minutes. Thank you, Bruce. Good afternoon, and thank you to the Chamber for hosting the event, to those who are watching, and for the territorial acknowledgement that you provided. My name is Sherry Moreover. I'm the federal Liberal candidate for Senate Gulf Islands. Like many of your members, I too am a small business owner and employer. I co-founded a national public affairs firm, a business that's driven to help clients who are working to build healthier, more inclusive communities. I'm an internationally recognized, award-winning communication strategist who loves to use my expertise for social good. The last few years have been very challenging for businesses and staff alike. With the implementation of necessary public health measures to protect us from the risks of COVID-19, which sometimes included temporary closures, the business community has continuously shown leadership. Our Prime Minister has said that he will have the backs of Canadians, including small and medium-sized businesses until this pandemic is over. And when we support Canadian businesses, we support workers, their families, and the communities that depend on them. On them. This is the heart of our plan to create jobs and grow our economy. 
While the support measures have evolved, the principles behind them haven't. We must continue to invest in businesses so you can return to normal business, maybe in some cases with diversified services or a new and nimble e-commerce strategy in hand. We haven't done enough of a, a, enough to tell people about the prudent economics of investing in business as an important part of our pandemic response. There's a strong economic case for supports from, for SEBA, the Canada Recovery Hiring Program, our child care program, our ongoing investments in housing, retraining and greening our economy during the recovery. These constitute the highest economic multiplier available. Every dollar invested in Canadians and small business stimulates our economy and has a ripple effect. If doing the right thing isn't enough of a reason for some, the significantly positive ripple effect should be. It just makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. And thank you to all four of you for those remarks. There will also be closing remarks from all of the candidates, which will happen in the reverse order of what was just done in this uh, speaking order we just used. So we're going to move along to some questions. Uh, this event that we're doing, we're doing in partnership of all of the uh, candidate sessions that we're doing with a couple of other organizations, the Greater Victoria Harbor Authority, the Vancouver Island Construction Association, the Urban Development Institute, and Destination Greater Victoria. I'd like to begin by talking about housing affordability, a frontline issue very major issue across this country, not just here on the island. Uh, cost of housing in this region is, is a big factor in so many elements of our lives. The Canadian Mor uh, Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation talks about something called a housing consortium, which would be a gathering and a group of people from those experiencing homelessness right up to homeowners participating in the real estate market. But there is a renewed interest, of course, in the affordable and low to middle income housing options being made available in our region. We just want to make sure that people that are the frontline workers, that are the restaurant workers, that are the, um, the teachers, people like that have access to housing they can afford to bring some stability into their lives. The Vancouver Island Construction Association points out that construction employs about 1.4 million workers across this country. It's $141 billion into our economy. It's about 7.5% of our GDP, and they will play a role in growing our economy back as we bounce forward out of this uh, pandemic, which we're dealing with right now. So increasing infrastructure investment we'd like to talk about. Canada is well positioned. We need to make investments, though, to fix some aging infrastructure, um, things like our roads, um, our ferry terminals, our ferry traffic, ventilation in hospitals and residences is going to be a factor. Um, seismic upgrades are all factors in our safety. So setting national goals around building sustainability into the infrastructure for supply chain efficiency and moving goods around. Uh, the funding for that has to be predictable. It has to be quick flowing. And it has to be aligned from the federal government with provincial, municipal and indigenous needs. So the question is, to achieve this, will you and your party commit to working to create an independent advisory board that can align governments at the provincial, municipal, and Indigenous level to address infrastructure deficits across Canada? Let's begin with uh, Sherry Moore-Arbour, please. Sherry, for about a minute and a half. Thank you very much for this question. It speaks to the interconnectedness, obviously, of um, you know, the, the complexities of building communities that are affordable and um, ideally have uh, livable supports, act as hubs, have access to public transportation and the amenities that ultimately produce low carbon footprints as well. Um, our government is absolutely, you know, uh, committed to and in our platform, we recommit to investments in infrastructure for building a new housing stock, which is a critical dimension, uh, remediation of existing housing stock, investments in 1.4 uh, million homes, ultimately. Um, but we've also made record investments in public transportation and uh, during, our, during our recent mandate. Um, so the, the the piece around uh, low carbon footprints, our, our um, investment in housing is all deeply interconnected in, uh, in our strategy um, with 2.7 billion over four years, which is double the current allocation to increase the National Housing Co-Investment Fund. Um, there's no question as well that the devolution of funding um, in recent decades has produced an unfair burden that municipalities bear um, in terms of the, um, 
the, the capital that they're responsible for managing. And so the federal government has a huge role to play in supporting remediation and building. Great, thank you, Sherry. Uh, David Bush, over to you for about a minute and a half, please. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, the federal government's role is one of consultation and leadership. And yes, we'll be seeking to work with all parties. We have a plan to work with the provinces and the municipal governments to meet and modernize their infrastructure. This means, amongst other things, connecting all Canadians to high-speed internet, as well as building the necessary transit, roads, and other infrastructure needed to keep people and goods moving to get our economy growing once again. We'll be looking to immediately get shovels in the ground on projects the provinces and municipalities have ready to go, whether it's for transit, road, rail, broadband. We'll be focusing on looking at getting Canadians back to work on things that will make sure they have a roof over their head, reduced commute times, and reduced emissions. We also want to make sure that we provide more flexibility, both to municipalities as well as First Nations, by removing some of the more onerous requirements to receive federal infrastructure funding. Amongst other things specific to housing, we're looking at putting in 1 million new homes within the next three years, investing in specifically rental housing, new rental housing, through both domestic and foreign investment, while at the same time recognizing that speculation is a problem. So if you're a foreigner not living in Canada, we're not going to be looking to tax the problem. We're going to be looking to put an outright two-year moratorium on foreign investment in residential homes for speculation purposes. Now, if you want to come to Canada, live in Canada, and live in the house, we welcome you to come here and pay Canadian taxes. But if it's only for speculation, we're going to ask you to instead invest in the rental housing. Thank you. Great. David, thank you very much. Uh, next, Elizabeth May, please. Elizabeth, about a minute and a half. The floor is yours. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. I'm trying to recall, but I think the nature of the question was more about structural changes to engage different orders of government in the same process of decision making. So uh, first, I do want to flag that when I first became a member of Parliament, it was the Saanich Peninsula Chamber of Commerce that told me their number one issue was housing affordability. And that, and the, and the manufacturers group within our local chamber of commerce, which is a large scale manufacturers, there's a real problem if you can't have the workforce able to afford to live near our establishment, whether it was Viking Air or whatever. So we did a lot of work. We formed a community roundtable, which involved the provincial government, involved uh, local stakeholders, and of course businesses. And we did make some progress in in moving some municipalities along. But what we want to do at the national level is is find a way to get because as everyone knows, it's, it's, um, we all know there's only one taxpayer, right? So the Grumpy Taxpayers Federation doesn't have to get on to me on that point. And when you don't have policy alignment and policy coherence, you've got the provinces spending money in one direction, the municipalities in a different direction, the federal government you know, and indigenous peoples that were part of your question, not engaged in the same decisions. What the Green Party is proposing is something that's modeled on the Australian Council of Governments where the Australian government being somewhat like ours, being a federated state with powerful sub-national states and of course municipalities, brings them all around the same table. Our version of course would also include state, I mean rather provinces and territories and federal government and municipalities, but also indigenous governments, First Nations, Métis and Inuit around the same table to ensure that we discuss and develop the same goals throughout all of those aspects of government. So around infrastructure, what are our infrastructure priorities? How do we achieve them? How do we make sure that we're spending money in the same direction and aligned? And that I think is going to make a big difference in ensuring that we have the, the infrastructure investments that are predictable. Okay, Elizabeth, I'm gonna stop you there and thank you very much for your comments. Appreciate it very much. Um, over to Sabina. Hi, thank you again, Bruce. And this question is at the heart of what we do at the NDP and, and why we're concerned. The gap between the rich and the poor is just growing so exponentially that we have to get a handle on it and allow people to be able to live where they work, which has been said several times. So we need to build uh, affordable green houses we need to retrofit houses so that people 
they can be greened and they are going to uh, be able to have more people living in them in a more sustainable way. We are concerned about pricing, working with the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. We're concerned about foreign speculation and using the uh, housing market like a stock market. But in the end, the NDP has the largest budget for Canada because our recovery out of COVID and this last year and a half has been so devastating to so many of us. And the climate emergency is just coming down on every way we can imagine and we're experiencing it and there's no denying that we're unable we have to learn how to create the table so that we can work with indigenous nations in a more one-to-one -one, uh, honest and parallel level respect treaties respect free prior and informed consent and and what, one of the things that I do at the Center for World Indigenous Studies is that we're trying to build a table internationally where things like UNDRIP can be instituted. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you all for your answers. Uh, the next category we would like to talk about has already been sort of referred to. That is the uh, idea of helping employers attract and retain workers. Uh, workforce strength has been a factor before COVID, during COVID, and we certainly are seeing it now in particular sectors. The construction industry has had an ongoing issue with uh, sourcing skilled labor in order for them to continue their work to build and develop our communities. Uh, the tech sector, we are <laughs> obviously very reliant on tech and we will be more so going forward. That sector will need ongoing support. Um, hospitality, tourism, healthcare is gonna be crucial. So we need workers in this region, we need to attract them and we need to retain them. So to fill the gap in the workforce, the question to you is, would you and your party commit to working with industry to recruit and train people who see these sectors like construction as a career of choice, especially among people who are underrepresented within our economy? Uh, let's begin with Elizabeth May, please, for about a minute and a half. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Yes, the answer is absolutely yes. And we're seeing a conundrum here. We Politicians usually talk about creating jobs. What we've got is a real crisis right now is finding workers for the jobs we've got. You know, you can't you can't help but notice when you go to restaurants that they can't be open all the hours that they want to be because they're they're shorthanded for cooks. Uh, the construction industry needs workers. This was the case before COVID in certain sectors, particularly pilots lab technicians, depending on where you looked in the economy, we had acute shortages, mining engineers, acute shortages. So we need to do those things that assist employers in bringing people into the industry. I love the frame of this question around untraditional workers are not as fully recognized in the workforce. Uh, in the construction industry, and I know that recently a, um, a number of women have taken up uh, trades and particularly elect uh, electricians and plumbers and finding that work very satisfying and uh, really uh, uh, that women are adaptable to that but don't normally necessarily think of that as a career of choice. Uh, for that we need to pursue the child care objectives that we are now have in front of us in Parliament. Uh, the BC government's been one of the ones that stepped up and said yeah we want to go with uh, universal affordable early childhood excellent learning, not just warehousing our children someplace, but actually investing in our kids. Um, I love the idea of working with industry to develop the programs. One thing that has occurred to me in, in talking to many local employers is that we need to transition out of the CERB and into something that says, we're going to top up your wages with a little bit more to help both the employers and the employees for a period of time post COVID. So uh, it's something that I'm pursuing in talking with other ministers in government. And I think my time's up. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's when the hand comes up like that, that's where I'm gonna kind of say, if you watch out for the hand, according to the timing. Uh, Sabina, you're up next for about a minute and a half, please. The floor is yours. Oh, sorry, I thought I was muted. Um, I, uh, again, affordability is the important piece here, how we get, workers into our region is to attract them with a beautiful place to live, an affordable place to live, uh, a place that upholds everybody and doesn't um, generate, uh, is comfortable for everyone, no matter what they look like or where they're from. 
Um, and so, and Indigenous people, I'm really excited about some of the new developments that are working with Indigenous people to make sure that there's training and jobs there for them. Um, that is an, an important piece. I know we have to reform EI so that it can work for Canadians more effectively. And again, we just have to create this amazing community. Immigration has to be part of this strategy because we're having a hard time finding workers but so we need to look at our retraining programs and we need to look at reunification of families so that we can get them here and working more efficiently and effectively and in a welcoming way thank you uh david bush you're up next would you please for about a minute and a half Thank you. Uh, the short answer to this one is absolutely yes. Some of the things that we're going to be looking at doing is doubling up the apprenticeship job creation tax credit so that we can get more places for apprentices to learn the skills of the trade. Uh, we've also in our plan have 250 million set aside over two years to create the Canada Job Training Fund and it will provide grants to organizations and employers um, for further projects to assist with that. But also we want to make sure that people who are unable to go back because the job may not particularly be there and may require some new training. We're going to have $10,000 available for loans for anyone who needs to upgrade their skills, retool or retrain. Now I happen to know a little bit about non-traditional roles being a nurse. Uh, at that point in time, I think men made up about 5% of my nursing class and about the same and less than that overall. And it's something that we need to do and we need to encourage people to look into those non-traditional roles. And this is a major problem with the labor shortage here on the island. One of my friends owns his own contracting company. And I asked him if he'd be able to come because it had a water leak to replace some drywall. And he's like, Dave, I am booking stuff two years out, but I will get somebody to your house as soon as I can if we can finish, you know, have a half day here or a half day there. So we desperately need to make sure we increase and work with industry to fill that labor gap. Now, finally, Elizabeth May was talking about a plan to transition out of CERB. Well, we have that in our platform. We will be looking to pay up to 25, or pardon me, up to 50% with a minimum of 25% of all new hires once CERB is done to assist small industry to be able to start up again and get going back to full speed because many of them have probably seen their revenues not just depleted, but their reserves depleted as well. So we want to help them be able to afford those new hires to get everything back up to speed. Great. Let's hold it there. Thanks, David, very much. And uh, the final word in this category is Sherry. Sherry, the floor is yours for a minute and a half. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, affordability for sure is a complication in recruitment. We have a lifestyle that is um, that makes this a highly desirable place to live. And the housing supply shortage uh, certainly creates pressure economically for people who are looking for work and um, are um, unable to afford life um, on a minimum minimum wage. Uh, so our plan around, uh, as it relates, we could obviously go in a, in a multitude of directions, but I really um, appreciated your point around underrepresented groups and what we're doing to help people transition back to work. So I would immediately point to the child care program as well, that that is a real um, barrier to employment for women who or parents who are looking to return uh, to the workforce. And that will enable people to make decisions and uh, choices that will ultimately help their families. Um, so some specific programs introducing a new labor mobility tax credit to allow workers to build uh, workers in building and construction trades to deduct up to $4,000 in eligible travel, make it easier for women and vulnerable groups to access training by requiring businesses to uh, businesses supported through certain programs to include wraparound supports make it easier for workers to relocate, generally speaking, um, keep experienced workers in the workforce, boost the participation of diverse Canadians in skilled trades and address specific needs in evolving sectors. Um, again, uh, establish a trusted employer system to streamline application processes for Canadian companies looking to hire foreign workers as well to fill certain labor shortages. 
fingers up if I'm seeing my time is on this side. Yes, thanks, Sherry, very much. We have a lot of material to cover, but thank you all for your for your points and for being succinct. So you'll find as we move through this conversation, all of these these issues and points will sort of interconnect with each other. As I mentioned, we have partners in this uh, in these sessions, uh, people like the Vancouver Island Construction Association, the Urban Development Institute, who who brought forward the point. Here here is a question: What can the federal government do to go back to what we're talking about with workforce? You know, when you take a look at the challenges that areas like the Keating Crossroad, the Keating Industrial Area, the airport lands, most of those workers are coming from elsewhere in this region. It's a large carbon footprint. It's time they're not spending with their family, all of that sort of thing. What can the federal government do and what can your party do to encourage local governments to increase housing supply in this region and in the region in which you're serving? Sabina, let's begin with you, please. Um, we have to work with all levels of government, including First Nations, in order to figure out how they can do this faster. As far as I understand, from some of my minister friends and things like that, there is not, the money hasn't come quick enough um, to get these buildings done in a timely manner. And so that we can actually have the housing available for people right now, because the projects are happening right now. So we need to make sure that the federal government is working with the uh, provinces and municipalities to get, um, put pressure on them, help them with money uh to get these projects going right away they are needed now thank you thank you sabina uh david bush over to you this is the number one issue i've been hearing at the door is housing the lack of housing people that are concerned because their kids can't afford to live here and we need to get the supply up as quickly as possible as i mentioned earlier our plan is involves building over a million houses within the next three years but also to make, release 15% of all federal lands and properties to the municipalities for high density residential homes. And along with that, the infrastructure for a transit corridor to be able to ensure that they can get to and from the workforce. Anything short of a rapid increase in order to get of the supply is not gonna be able to control the growth, let alone get it down to where people can once again have the dream of being able to afford a home, or even these days, a condo, a condo. Thank you, David. Uh, Sherry, you're up next. Thanks, Bruce. We're, we're clearly all talking to the same to the same voters. Affordability is a priority issue that um, is on the top of, I think, all of our minds. Um, you know, the conundrum is that it involves re resolving it involves multiple levels of government working together and um, working with community. So while we often have, you know, uh, a great OCP uh, guiding the work, um, I've unfortunately seen affordable housing projects die at the community consultation level uh, because the community hasn't sufficiently, hasn't felt that it's been sufficiently involved throughout the process and um, isn't necessarily supportive of where uh, purpose-built housing, for example, is going. So I think part of it is that we have this paradox that affordable land is often in areas that aren't supported by public transit and other sort of services and the areas where uh, purpose-built rentals and densification makes sense. The land is prohibitively expensive and the process is quite complex. We are absolutely supportive of investing in housing, supporting municipalities and other orders of government in investing in purpose-built housing and densification processes. Um, and also in the wraparounds that are needed, including investments in public transit. And I think that we've demonstrated that in the last six years that we are, that we recognize that there's a connectedness between um, the services that are available in urban um, environments and, and the housing issue. Um, and, you know, oh, time's up. Thank you. We'll probably loop back on some of this stuff at some point anyway. Uh, Elizabeth May, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you. It's it's uh, as I said from the moment when I first was elected, which was um, again such an honor, and thank my voters in Senate Gulf Islands. But it, the, it's been the business community that's been raising this, and the way you framed the question, Bruce, is about what can the federal government do to encourage 
local governments to expand the housing supply. I've gotten a lot of good advice about this over the years from people like Casey Edge at the Builders Association in Victoria about, uh, and, and you know, from other local businesses, how do we get over the fact that as other uh, colleagues have said, the price of land is a huge impediment and then expectations around some community values in some of our local governments do not want to see an intensification or a densification. We've made progress in the last number of years with uh, various municipal governments within the peninsula, uh, loosening up on things like nanny suites, engaging more building, but we do need at the federal level to um, bring back the MERBs, the purpose-built rental housing tax breaks. And we also need to attach to that, that the rents are held outside of market so that they just don't get flipped and become out of the reach of the people who are in the local workforces. And again, the Council of Canadian Governments giving municipalities a seat at the table with the feds and the provinces and indigenous governments to say, what are the solutions? Because they're multifaceted and they're not always about money, but let's face it, the municipal order of government in this country has about 10 cents out of every dollar collected in tax. And that has an impact on what they can afford to do. Thank you very much. I want to kind of go along that line once again um, with this next question. It doesn't need a really long answer, but uh, one of the issues affecting affordability in this region uh, is the lack of appropriate rental housing, as, as has been referenced here. So currently developers who build and sell property are taxed higher than those who build and rent property. Okay, so would you and your party support a review of the tax policies with respect to landlords of purpose built rental properties that could have them treated like other businesses? Uh, David, let's start with you. Uh, let's try to keep this one really short. Uh, already mentioned it, it's in our plan. We want to attract domestic and foreign investment into a purpose built rental properties. So the answer, yes, it's in our plan. Take a look. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth May, over to you. Thanks. And, and this is one of the examples of where I, the ideas that I got from exactly Casey Hedge at the Victoria Home Builders are in the Green Party platform and have been for some time. Bring back the special tax treatment to encourage rental built properties. And also this, this there's one weird one. If you go out and as a builder, you build a condo, but the condo units are staying empty. If you decide to make that available for affordable rent until such time as maybe down the road, you want to sell it. At that point, you are dinged with a deemed GST as if you'd sold the condo unit. So obviously this is a disincentive to taking empty new condo units and make them available for rent. There is a lot we can do to make sure that we're working with industry to create the proper tax treatment to encourage access to housing. And I would say our whole tax system is so absurdly overcomplicated. Greens have called for some time for a new tax commission to review the whole tax code to simplify and make it make sense and also to make sure that the wealthiest in our society pay their full share. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Sabina, the floor is yours. Um, we are very concerned about the tax system as well in the country, and uh, I know that we want to reform the tax system. Uh, that includes specifically for rental built housing, um, but we want to help renters by giving them uh, an extra bit of money if they need it to help pay their rent. Uh, we want to waive the federal GST on new builds for purpose-built housing. We want to have non-profit housing available to people. Um, it's a major aspect, again, I, like I said, of our platform affordability. And that includes any way that we can make that happen. And, and purposely, we will work with every level of government to make sure that, that uh, housing is available to Canadians. Thank you. Uh, Sherry, the last word is yours. Thanks. I'm going to keep this short as well. I think that it's really critical that we um, incentivize the um, the ability to produce purpose built rentals and to actually get them built, whether it's process, whether it's, um, you know, compensatory tax measures, um, investment. Uh, there's clearly a shortage. That shortage is connected to a lot of other municipal issues that are highly problematic uh, around employment, traffic, et cetera. So um, I think that, you know, we are like the others have said, we are also committed to uh, supporting all of the various ways, including the tax um, amendments that would be helpful. 
Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to change direction a little bit here and talk about tourism, which has been a pretty hard situation over this whole period of time here. And of course, in the jurisdiction that you are all vying for, uh, you have BC Ferries, you've got YYJ, you've got the Anacortes Ferry, you've got attractions, you've got wineries, you've got butterfly gardens, you've got the beautiful Butchart Gardens, right, which is a world-class location. They're a respectful and robust employer. They treat their employees well. They all of these things are in play right now. So the tourism experience is across our region. It's not just in your jurisdiction, but it's everywhere. Our partners at Destination Greater Victoria and the Greater Victoria Harbor Authority have some questions. And it's another one that our chamber has been uh, bringing forward quite a bit in the last little while. Would your party commit to continuing the wage and rent subsidies based on lost revenue until at least next April for tourism operators who have not had the normal robust tourist season to see them through their shoulder season and get them through the springtime. So would you commit to continuing the wage and rent subsidies at least until next April? Uh, Sherry, you ended it last time. Let's have you start at this time, please. Okay, great. Yes. Um, in fact, we've introduced additional measures in our platform targeted specifically at tourism uh, to supplement the hardships we would anticipate from a continuation of uh, of the COVID um, pandemic and its impacts on tourism, uh, which include uh, rent and wage subsidy for uh, those who would qualify in the tourism sector up to 75% throughout the winter going up until the end of March. Um, and yes, to your question. Uh, great, thank you. Sabina. Yes, we push the liberal, liberal government to ensure that SIR was something people could live on and to have the wage subsidy move from 10% to 75%. And we know that in order to support and help Canadians, we have to get through this together. And yes, it will cost money to do this, but we, if we don't move together, we won't recover together and we need to do that. Thank you, Sabina. Uh, Elizabeth. Thank you. I, I'm a very, very vigorous supporter of the tourism industry within Parliament. I'm a member of a, the Tourism Caucus, and we collectively did put as much pressure as we could, including members of the governing party, all of us together signed a letter to asking Christian Freeland as Minister of Finance to do more for the tourism sector. And I personally was very disappointed with a small amount in budget 2021. The answer to the question is resoundingly yes. And I would add to that when we talk about rents in our area, we need to talk about mortgage. I never got them to quite see that issue, but I work closely with um, the wonderful businesses in this area and tremendously creative brains that have tried so hard through pandemic to make us whole. Uh, people like Paul Nursey and people like uh, Dave Cowan at Butcher Gardens. I mean, this has been crushing for the tourism sector. And I believe we're still in free fall in tourism and we need to put much more supports there. So the answer to this question without doubt is yes and yes and yes. And I hope I'm reelected to keep working on it. Thank you, Elizabeth. David Bush. Thanks Bruce. We need to do more not less to help our hospitality and tourism sector. Uh, they've taken it in the teeth right from the get-go, and they're, while others, some are starting to move out, it's going to be a long time before they're going to be able to stand up on their own again. Other things that we're looking to do in addition is to increase the $60,000 SIBA to $200,000, because the $60,000 due to the duration, the ongoing duration, just isn't enough. We keep the qualification criteria the same. Uh, and again, up to 25% would be forgiven at the end of the day, depending upon the business's losses. A few other things we're looking at doing as well to help the hospitality and tourism is the dine out on from Monday to Wednesday, where we'd be picking up or rather giving a, a discount and picking up a portion of your tab if you go out and support your local restaurants. And we also need to look at those small craft harbors where we'd be doubling the funding to them because they haven't had any increase or at least not a significant increase in funding for the better part of a decade. And they also need help as well. And that'll help bring in more of the small boats and the small crafts to updated small marinas. Thank you, David, very much. Um, I want to talk about a couple of specific things again on a regional basis. Uh, there are people that are that are going to the attractions like 
the always amazing Butchart Gardens and the wineries and others like that when they come in through certain portals into our region. The Belleville Terminal downtown brings in people on car ferries and passenger ferries who then disperse throughout the rest of the province, if not the rest of Canada. Uh, federal funding is probably needed to get the infrastructure upgraded at the Belleville Terminal, also at the Conference Centre, which is also an attraction point of bringing people here. Can we get your comments on federal funding for things like Belleville and the Victoria Conference Centre? And let's begin with Elizabeth May, please. Again, this is part of critical infrastructure, and we need to think holistically about what the whole sector needs. And when we're looking at um, people who are traveling to this area, particularly marine access, I was very active right before writ drop, trying to sort out uh, what we were doing with changing the requirements for people entering Canada and having different rules for ground enter entrance and different rules for marine entrance brings to mind that the need to think holistically. Uh, bringing in infrastructure funds from the federal government uh, for the tourism sector needs to look at these different points of access. Again, uh, I, I, I don't think this should be hard to do because we are going to be looking, please soon, sooner than later at a post pandemic recovery and investing in places that uh, where the access points are underfunded is critical to make sure that we're able to welcome tourists, um, distribute that uh, tourism benefit through the region by making sure the infrastructure is ready to roll out the red carpet. Thank you, Elizabeth. David. These would be examples of great infrastructure projects that I spoke about earlier that we're ready and we're prepared and just looking forward to get things going fast. It gets people working, it encourages people to come in, and it'll be encouraging them to spend their money because that's what's ultimately going to be needed to get our tourism sector back up and running is you need to get the tourists coming back as soon as it is safe. And so, yes, the, we have the plan. Go take a look at it. It's there. And we're look we're ready for the projects as quickly as they can come in. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, Sabina, over to you, please. My uh, my um, office, because of COVID-19, is a 1972 VW bus. <laughs> and I can't wait to the Belleville Terminal to open. Uh, and so that we can get over to Port Angeles and see this beautiful area and they can do the same coming to us. So we need to put a lot more infrastructure into that. And that also goes for Anacortes Ferry to make it ex accessible and so that we can um, boost our tourism through that. Um, we not only have a most beautiful place where we live, uh, we also have a very intelligent place. So the conference center is extremely important for the intellectual prowess that we have around these islands and, uh, and where we are, I am near UVic. Um, but it will also, we used the downtown centers um, to help share ideas. And at this critical time, we need those bold ideas so we can move forward. Thank you, Sabina. Sherry. Hi, sorry, I realized I wasn't on mute. Hopefully I wasn't creating any background noise there. Um, I, I would say, yes, we are committed to investing um, in infrastructure projects um, with the notion that we will be planning to build back better. So projects with an emphasis on um, sort of green, uh, green investment, most particularly. Um, I will say that, you know, we need to see more funding allocated for uh, ferry terminals and for um, ferries as well. And that would be absolutely a high priority on my list uh, of items to strongly advocate for. Uh, and the tourism sector in general, um, you know, building the infrastructure that we know leads to a huge economic impact for our, our part of the world. Thank you. Uh, and as we reopen things and we again go back to the issue of workforce that's going to be backfilling all of this stuff, a uh, really quick answer on this one, if I could, please. Um, the enhanced EI and initially the CERB, CERB that was put in place um, was extended by the federal government. They even at the time referred to it as an uneven response. 
because it helped some areas more than others. And it was actually a bit harmful here because we couldn't get workers back into the workforce. Will your party commit to winding down benefit programs like enhanced EI that replaced the CERB program? Sabina, let's start with you. Yes, we have to work with all of our partners to figure out the best ways to move forward and so that it works for everybody. Uh, thanks, David. Yeah, as soon as it's safe, we'd be looking to wind down the CERB or the Sioux and replacing it, as I said, with our program to pay people to go back to work. Thank you. Sherry. Absolutely. Um, we've begun the process and uh, and it clearly we're hearing that um, employers are looking for a balance of support uh, for their workers, but also the need to recruit uh, recruit people in our region is um, something we're hearing quite a bit as well. Thank you. And Elizabeth. Yeah, we want to take a big, bold step in the Green Party and bring in a guaranteed livable income. Then everyone will know that they are not going to fall below the poverty line. They go back to work and keep their guaranteed livable income. They At a certain income point, it's it's an in and out transaction. It's uh, it, and it will not only just pay for itself, it will save us money in health care costs because poverty is the single largest determinant of health. It'll save us money in the criminal justice system. It'll help our young people get a good start at university. We'll, we could talk more about post-secondary and not having tuition. But overwhelmingly, we need people to go back to work. But some of the employers are not going to be able to afford what it's going to take to entice people back to work. They're looking at their lives and saying, oh, that wasn't so good before. Well, you got to get back to work. We got to have employees in our businesses. The business community can't afford to pay more right now. So there has to be a kind of a sliding scale. And we believe it starts with a guaranteed livable income. Thank you. I um, want to swing into another topic here. Uh, in addition to all of the frustration and heartbreak we've had over the last 18 months, we had the heartbreaking confirmation of the tragedy outcome the strategic outcome of, of residential schools. That has now turned us around to a point where we're going to start looking at what reconciliation looks like on the, on the economic side. This chamber and I on Canada Day did a public acknowledgement of the fact that chambers and organizations like it had in fact always been implicit in the suppression of Indigenous economy and culture. Full stop. Full fact. How will you and your party commit to working with First Nation businesses and Indigenous entrepreneurs to help them access financing that for among other reasons, the, the complications and the restrictions of the Indian Act have been put in place and that has not been available to them. Uh, Sherry, I'll begin that with you, please. Thank you for your words and for the question. Um, I am an indigenous business owner and um, I, I, I know that we all take, you know, the, the issue of reconciliation very seriously, those who are running in Saanich Gulf Islands. Um, a commitment to economic reconciliation is a is a big part of reconciliation and acknowledging just what you said Bruce is uh, I, I feel lands on me with significance. Um, we are as a federal government committed to the work that we uh, oversee so the procurement process ensuring that it is inclusive low barrier and that 5% of federal contracts are um, are awarded to indigenous uh, companies um, and individuals, but we're also committed to expanding the Aboriginal entrepreneurship program to enable businesses to access new low, uh, sorry, new zero interest loans with a 10% advance, um, create a navigator position to help Indigenous entrepreneurs find programs that apply to their situation. This is hugely uh, helpful and uh, is a big equity piece to be able to find uh, somebody in business that is similar to your business and uh, navigate the various uh, levels of programming that are available that may not be clear to you um, and work with all governments to analyze and, and as appropriate adjust eligibility criteria to be sure that the programs are inclusive and again, low barrier. So it's about finding the programs, uh, being able to apply for them, being supported if you need to have support through peer programs, and um, and also being very responsible about managing our own procurement processes at the federal level. But thank you, like honestly, thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer, uh, Sabina. 
I'm going to ask you, Bruce, or can you repeat just the last part of the question? Yeah, how would you commit to working with First Nation businesses and Indigenous entrepreneurs to help them access financing that has been restricted, uh, among other ways, due to the Indian Act or has not been available in the past? Yes, thank you. Um, so we have to do a national reconciliation across the um, board. Uh, the first thing we would do is uh, obviously implement all of the truth and reconciliation uh, um, commitments that we have come up with as a country and we need to apply and implement. And that would include uh, funds available for Indigenous entrepreneurship and for development. We would like to create a National Council for Reconciliation so that we can make a timeline and make sure these things are happening quickly and timely. I think it'll benefit the entire country. And again, it'll give us uh, an opportunity to show to the world that we are working on this stuff. The world has seen these, what's happening in Canada and uh, we need to show that we know how to deal with it and we can move forward in a positive and productive way. Thank you very much. Uh, David. Thank you. Um, we need to work with the First Nations and other Indigenous groups to ensure that they're partners in prosperity and they can, they can benefit from the economic development. Uh, to this end, the Conservative government will create the Canadian Indigenous Enterprise Corporation and it's going to guarantee loans to Indigenous groups so that they can invest in projects and related infrastructure at the local level. Now, Conservative government will provide an initial $5 billion of capital for investments in these projects. Uh, also, in the spirit of reconciliation, we want to encourage Indigenous communities and existing development companies, as well as industry, to work together. And to do this, we'll be providing a further $10 million a year to support collaboration and encourage partnership between these two groups. Uh, our party was the party that created the TRC. And now we need to make sure that those calls to actions get implemented. We negotiated the Malnuth and Tawasin treaties. And anyone who's taken the ferry to Vancouver has seen the economic development that has come out of the Tawasin First Nation Treaty. And we look forward to continuing this work as the next government and helping First Nations and their entrepreneurs. Thank you, David. Elizabeth May. Thank you. This gives me an opportunity to acknowledge the territory that I'm on, as you acknowledge where you are, Bruce and Victoria, I'm on Wasonic territory here. It's a huge honor to live and work and participate and work with, which is an interesting relationship that people don't often think of, that a member of parliament who has constituents who are First Nations, I also relate on a nation to nation basis with chief and councils of the four First Nations on the peninsula and on the islands. And the first step we need to acknowledge is that under UNTRIP, these programs should be developed with Indigenous entrepreneurs and Indigenous people in the lead. Uh, we need, uh, we're the only party that's, that's uh, accepted that we should uh, renounce the doctrine of discovery. We definitely need to respect the Douglas treaties, which affect the peoples of this territory and which have not been respected. Uh, but ultimately, uh, what's in the way here is, as the question references, is the Indian Act. Uh, we have a piece of legislation on the books, which is overwhelmingly racist legislation. And the government of South Africa used the Canadian Indian Act to develop and model apartheid. It's not the work of a moment to get rid of the Indian Act. It's a long, complicated process. And many First Nations and what Métis and Inuit groups may want to keep the Indian Act uh, for their particular form of governance. But it needs to be a project that we all work on to decide this is humiliating, embarrassing, and a scandal that this is still the legislative framework for Indigenous peoples on this territory. We work together and we listen to Indigenous entrepreneurs for what they think is going to help them succeed. Thank you all for your comments on that. I'm just going to add to that when we did the uh, acknowledgement of what had been going on historically, uh, this chamber announced the creation of an Indigenous economic reconciliation task force and the members of that task force will be indigenous business owners who will tell us what to do will give us direction so that we can bring them into the business community in general here of course with great respect to their normal terms and their ways of doing business we're not imposing values on them we're giving them an opportunity to grow and connect we're very proud to have uh, created that here at this chamber of commerce uh we're out of time we uh we didn't get to some of the things that are very common in discussions like childcare, immigration, climate change. I think all of those things are covered 
quite a bit, but we've touched on some new territory here. So thank you for all of that. So just to wrap it up here, let's give everybody about a minute and a half to do some closing remarks. And as I said, we will do this in the reverse order that we did for the introductions. So to begin the end, if you will, the candidate for the Liberal Party of Canada, Sherry Moore Arbour. Sherry. Thank you very much, Bruce, for the opportunity to talk about uh, the local, the old local impact of uh, all of the platforms that we we are speaking to today. Um, you know, the liberal the liberal government has put forward a platform that will continue to invest in Canadians and small business, medium sized business, and will produce, um, as I said, economic multipliers that will benefit our communities. And so, you know, part of the balance is the compassionate side caring for um, business and their and those they employ, and thus the communities that they're in during the continued pandemic response. And our programs are committed to that very that very thing and um, and then moving forward investing in building back better uh, creating greater equity and a greener economy uh, moving forward. Thank you very much uh, next for closing remarks Conservative Party of Canada candidate David Bush David. Thank you and thanks again everyone for paying attention and listening to the questions and answers today. I hope everyone does get out and vote if you haven't already and that you make sure your vote reflects the path that you think is going to be best for Canada. If you're like me and you're deeply concerned about the climbing inflation, the empty promises, the expanding list wait list for healthcare, our record deficits, as well as the, well, the many empty promises on the environment, I would ask you to vote for change and to vote for David Bush, the Conservative Party of Canada and Aaron O'Toole on September 20th. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, now closing remarks from the candidate for the Green Party of Canada, Elizabeth May. Thank you so much. And again, thanks to the chamber for hosting this. I, I really want to focus on the political opportunity for the voter in Saanich Gulf Islands. And that is who can represent you best. A lot of that depends on how the cards are dealt, if you will. Oh, we've had a little freeze up from Elizabeth there. Um, let's reset that and come back if we can. So Sabina, I'll move to you for closing remarks and then we will loop back with uh, Elizabeth after that. So again, the uh, candidate for the New Democratic Party, Sabina Singh. Hi, again, I'm Dr. Sabina Singh. I would love to be your representative for the island and to join all my island MPs. You have in the Green Party a situation where you're Candidate has recycled the same things for 13 years, um, a Green Party that's in disarray, uh, and a Conservative candidate whose videos have shown his misunderstanding of systemic racism and his inability to understand what racism really is, and a leader who has let him be there, and who has also made similar remarks that show he does not understand systemic racism. The Liberals have had six years and have made many promises that they have not kept. And it seems like they, their leader is more interested in photo ops than he is in working for Canadians. I, like my leader, Jagmeet Singh, want to work for Canadians, want to work together with our Ireland NDP team. Please vote NDP in the next federal election. Thank you, Sabina. And I think technology has made the return of Elizabeth May possible. So please, Elizabeth, for closing remarks. Bruce, how much time was there on the clock when I suddenly disappeared? Uh, let's just start again. Start from okay, the thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want again, I wanted to thank the chamber for this opportunity. I also want to thank the leadership of so many people in the business community. Through the pandemic, I've worked very closely with many of the business leaders in the Victoria Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank John Wilson of Wilson's Bus Lines in particular for being so generous and endorsing me as the candidate for re-election. We're very likely to be going into a minority parliament. If you will, the value proposition right now is what which one of us as candidates can best serve our community in a parliament where no one party has 100% of the power. This is a place where relationships across party lines, a willingness to collaborate, cooperate, put aside partisan differences and get things done for our community and the whole business ecosystem, whether we're looking at, at tourism and boy, how we have to fight the US right now. I just wanna 
throw out there how alarmed I am by what the Alaska government wants to propose in terms of bypassing our coast. There are times and places where there is no room for partisan rancor, pettiness, and gossip. You just have to roll up your sleeves and work together. I think I've proven that I'm good at that. I work really hard, but I don't work with a partisan edge. I work to make sure life is better for my community. And for this planet, we didn't touch on climate, but it's an overwhelming concern for so many residents here and for, for our kids and grandkids. I would be grateful for your support to keep doing this work. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to all of you. Um, something I do at the conclusion of all of these events is give all of you a very sincere thank you for running, for being a candidate. It is, as we say, this is not for the faint of heart. This is not for the thin skinned. This is for people who have a dedication and a devotion and a will to make this country as great as it can possibly be. So to all of you for your commitment and your dedication, thank you for standing in your candidacy. And we very much appreciate you doing that to participate in our democracy. Uh, best of luck to you all, everybody. Don't forget to vote on the 20th. Uh, we're gonna be doing one more of these sessions tomorrow with the candidates from the Langford Couch and Riding. We've had two previous ones, all of which have been recorded and they're available on the Chamber website. Again, thank you to all the candidates. Thank you to all of you for watching. On behalf of the Chamber, have a great day. Thank you.